That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Love Fraud, a new uh, television series that will debut on Showtime as of August 30th. Uh, it's a four-part miniseries that will uh, unspool until uh, the last episode, September 20th, 2020. Uh, it is the latest project by Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady, uh, of course the Oscar-nominated documentarians that are best known for Jesus Camp. Um, but they've... Uh, uh, broached a, a variety of subjects. Um, I also recall a, a documentary they did on Norman Lear that's worth checking out. Uh, but this is a uh, series that unfolds in real time basically about one Richard Scott Smith, a Lothario of sorts who cons a lot of women in the Midwest out of uh, their money. Yeah. There will be spoilers, obviously. Yes. Uh -huh. So we start with a group of women basically recounting their love affair with love affairs with Richard, mm -hmm. who also goes by Mikey or Scott. <laughs> he has three aliases: Richard, Mikey, or Scott. Yes. But they're all recounting uh, these tales when we're introduced to a bounty hunter named Carla, mm -hmm. who says she will work pro bono to find Richard and bring him to the authorities because we find out he has like warrants for his arrest mm -hmm. uh, for a domestic violence charge and for violating his probation. Mm -hmm. So the first two episodes are them looking for him, basically. Mm -hmm. Episode three, they corner him. So the initial story uh, and most of his affairs take place in Missouri. Kansas City. Mm -hmm. But we find out that he has fled to Tennessee. Yep. And in Iowa, uh, I think one of the warrants was out of Iowa as well. That's right. But yeah, yeah, around that kind of trifecta. So episode three, we find him in Tennessee where they spend time following him around in order to get enough uh, information to then call the cops, which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he is ultimately arrested. And episode four is the documentarians interviewing Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, he does end up getting arrested and prosecuted. We see him go to court. He's sentenced to 172 days. I thought it was 190. It was 172. Oh. It wasn't quite six months. Okay. Um, the end of the documentary shows him six months after he's sentenced. Um, like back at it again, they have surveillance of him at a hotel with a woman in the pool. He's loving up on her, so we can assume that he's back to his old tricks. Mm -hmm. The end. Mm -hmm. All right. So that yeah, that is a very uh, brief synopsis because each episode is about uh, fifty minutes, forty five minutes. 50? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, There's a lot to say. Um, I'll start off by saying that some of the headlines I read about this documentary compare it to Tiger King. Okay, so it premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival, and notably this is the first time a documentary, a television event has uh, premiered the first night of a major film festival, but uh, Ewing and Grady are Sundance alums, so that really doesn't surprise me. Um, but yes, I, I think that uh, in our continual search for something to binge on, uh, and if <clears throat> if you're a fan of true crime and Dateline, like this is this is certainly something of that ilk. Um, there was an IndieWire article that could compare this to Tiger King. Sorry, uh, that I don't quite agree. <laughs> I, I think we're talking about apples and oranges, but yeah. So I will say I think it's false advertising. <clears throat> this story is not as gripping, or riveting, violent, uh, unnerving as all of the other. You know, Tiger King, Making of a Murderer, uh, what's the one with Robert Frost or... Uh, Durst. Durst, sorry, Robert Frost. <laughs> I know who that is. Robert Durst. Um, uh, by Jarecki. Um, I'm blinking on the title. Um, anyway. But, but yeah. Uh, and others. Uh, so the biggest comparison, I think, would be the podcast series Dirty John. Mm -hmm. Sure. This does not compare. Richard Scott Smith is a very basic man, which we'll get into, and the women who are frauded by him, uh, that was air quotes, uh, the documentary does a really poor job of explaining exactly what he did to these women, except like fraud them emotionally. Yeah, I, but, well, because as Carla the Bounty Hunter, uh, who's kind of, I'd say, the star of at least the first episode, um, 
explains that because he marries them, uh, he he's within his legal rights. He has he has access to their money. Yeah. Um, and I also, but they also explain these women don't have money. Like right, these are right. like very middle class women. They don't have a lot of resources. He clearly is not living in the lap of luxury. Right. And uh, and as when he's finally interviewed, that's kind of his retort. Is he you know he really meant. Uh, all of the loving things he said because what after all did he get out of this um, so I wish that uh, out of the four episodes they had spent one of them kind of uh, delving into it at least like professionals opinions of what his oh, yeah. psychosis is um, Go and, ahead. and also so the first episode um, which I guess I'll just say this now the first and fourth episodes I find the most the most um, interesting uh, and, and Watchable, uh, but the first one opens very in a standard way. Uh, we get talking heads of uh, three women, uh, Tracy, Sabrina, and Ellen, uh, kind of explaining their very religious backgrounds and beliefs, uh, which led them into the lair of Richard Scott Smith. Um, but uh, I, the conversation we had after the first episode was how these women that are being fooled by a man online. I, I'd like to see in thirty years when their daughters that age will women that have grown up that have been able to navigate dating online not be fooled as easily sure uh, well let's before you get into all that let's oh. just break down the episode so episode one we're introduced to the idea of richard scott smith or richard yeah that's his name richard scott smith mm -hmm. but so like you said these women are sort of recounting their um, affairs with him so he's basically lied to all of the women he's met saying he's a pilot um he likes to ride motorcycles sort of the um the unifying uh trait between all these women is that they find his religious beliefs to be very appealing so they all seem to be christian the, the talking heads that we get there yeah but somebody else makes the comment that he he's like a chameleon if you're an atheist he'll change his views to that right, we right. just don't talk to any of those women but i bring that up because i for sure thought because of how the documentary is marketed i thought for sure because it says like twists and turns and like you know unbelievable uh you know ending I thought for sure it was going to be related to like a cult, something like that. But there's none of that. It's very straightforward. But anyway, the way he's able, from what I understood from episode one, the way he's able to kind of get these women to uh, sort of believe in him financially is that he has some paralysis on his face. Mm -hmm. That is not, it, we're not, we don't know why, but these women say that he told them that he's the victim of malpractice. He had some surgery on his face, a doctor incorrectly cut a nerve, and now he has some paralysis. He kind of has like a crooked smile, mm -hmm. and when we, the final episode when we see him, he, he, the, the biggest defect we see is that one of his eyes just blinks out of control. But, so obviously he was able to convince them that he, uh, he's the victim <laughs> of malpractice and that he was going to receive millions of dollars. So the bulk of episode one is establishing that, and then we meet Carla. The bounty hunter. Who's the Kathleen Zellner of Love? The Bosch. wannabe Kathleen Zellner, wannabe, uh, uh, who's the Tiger King lady? Oh, Carol. Carol Baskin. Baskin. She's, to me, she's more like Dog the Bounty Hunter's wife. Sure. She's kind of this, like, bleach blonde, chain smoking old white lady who clearly hates men. Not in that anti feminist way, but just like all she talks about is how no man would ever take advantage of her. She hates men that hurt women. Right, right. We, uh, like under same but uh, uh -huh. so we get introduced to her we also see um, one you know the only we get a few glimpses into Richard's background mm -hmm. so in episode one we get his best friend from high school mm -hmm. whose name is Gary which actually you know now that you say that bringing him up again I can see why there's a Tiger King quality perhaps to it the um... yes it's a stretch it's, <laughs> but yeah so he has like this Probably one of the most physically unappealing people I've seen on screen in a long time, who's surrounded by cats, recounting his time getting to know Gary in high school, or Richard in high school, and how he was basically like a womanizer. Sure. Which, uh, you really don't even need that. I think what's more illuminating is his aunt. Yes. And, and sister, he has a 12, uh, si she's introduced in what? Significantly episode? younger. Yeah. 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 Um, episode one ends with... Uh, we kind of, because we're trying to find him we're trying to find Richard and we see that he's moving out of a luxury apartment building mm -hmm. and like where is he going so episode 2 we find out that 
they, they kind of just dropped some knowledge that Richard faked a heart attack at one point because yeah. like a jeweler was searching for him. Mm-hmm. I felt like that was just so much of this documentary is like they're trying to make more out of this story than there actually is. Yes. Like, okay, so he faked a heart attack to get out of paying for, like, some jewelry he bought. But that's how the episode starts. Um, we also get introduced to, to the idea of this woman who he got into business with. What was her name? Uh, Carla with a C. Oh, Carla with a K. Carla with a K. Yes. Carla with a C is the bounty hunter. Carla with the K is another woman who was married. He sort of, like wooed her got her to leave her husband mm-hmm. and convinced her to start a crab shack in uh, wichita wichita mm-hmm. kansas so he's out there working uh helping her set up this crab shack it's a big success and then we find out one day he leaves with all of the payroll money mm-hmm. that's it um we have carla sort of explaining how that happened she comes and goes uh we're also introduced she reminded me kind of like she looked like she could be lynn shay's sister Yes, a bloated Lin <laughs> Shay. Um, we also get introduced to the idea. We have two. Cra- it's not called Crab Shack. I don't call it Crab Shack. Crab I'm, Kings. Crab Kings. We are introduced to two employees of Crab Kings. Mm-hmm. This black woman who's telling all the business mm-hmm. about what she thought about these people, which I actually found entertaining. Amusing, yeah. She looks like she's trying to ham it up for the camera. Then we have another woman named Tammy, mm-hmm. who Richard was an employee of Carla's, who Richard like says so his thing is he falls in love with all of these women Mm -hmm. like immediately tells them he's in love so she seems protective of him she also seems like a weirdo we'll get into these women and i'm not shaming these victims but she seems like a weirdo she seems proud of the fact that he liked her and doesn't want to give information even though all of these people in the documentary are trying to find him and the women who are associated with him don't want to say like they're very proud to say they know him but well, they don't want to say where he is. I thought it's also important that we didn't mention that uh, one, uh, was it the first wife? Somebody had set up a blog. Oh, that's important. So yeah. there's a blog called like Crook. There's some blog. I'll post it. But it's... Because Tracy's daughter in the first episode was suspicious because he kept trying to move up the wedding day for his mom. And the daughter's like, this is not right. And digs through his truck and finds a lot of... Uh, pieces of paper that have all these different kinds of names which she writes down and Googles and finds this blog. That's important, yeah. So one of the daughters discovers this blog and that's kind of how all of these victims... This revenge squad has revenge been able to squad. come together and communicate. And also of note, um, as much as I wanted to really like Carla the Bounty Hunter, who's working pro bono, mind you, but... Uh, all of her tips come from what these women are, the information that's generated on this blog. Anyway. You know, that made me feel like when we bought the house we live in now, mm-hmm. and I felt like we did all the research. Mm-hmm. I found our house on Zillow. I don't know why we paid this real estate agent. <laughs> that's how Carla feels, like a real estate agent who didn't help you find your house. But she was able to help, but she <laughs> helps um, suss out what happens with the private investigators. She she is important to them. but She is. Um, it, she it just is. also goes to show that you still have to do some of your own work. Episode two gets in more into depth with the other Carla, the cr- Crab Shack lady, and her husband Jim. Mm-hmm. A lot of time is spent on them. Yes. For I feel like who cares? No. Sure. Like why are we spending so much time on Jim and how Richard stole his wife? But really, she she left him. So I feel like that's fair game. The only thing of note is that the employee, the black lady, says that she's that she, Carla, took her husband's 401k mm-hmm. to pay for Crab Shack. Right. We don't know if that's true, but that's what the employee says. Well, the husband said that too, because when... Oh, he does say that. Because okay. when Carla asked for a divorce, he went immediately to the bank, I guess as one does. Uh, Some information we get in episode two. Uh, for, so we're introduced to Richard's aunt, mm-hmm. and she explains that Richard's mom's mom and grandmother so his great grandmother and grandmother died together in like a suicide pact in a fire in a fire like they burned their house down and killed themselves together and the mom had sort of like ran away but then one day when Richard is older came back into his life like as a teenager and like took him away Mm -hmm. so she kind of implies like I don't know what she did to him which then I thought oh based on all the marketing Maybe he was, like, molested by his mom, or maybe they had, like, an inappropriate sexual relationship, and... Sure. But we don't get into that at all. 
Um, the aunt reminded me of a Tim Burton character, particularly Olin Shea. Olin Jones is from Edward Scissorhands. Yeah, she's a lot. She's like wearing a lot of makeup. Her hair's too dark. She's wearing like little girl barrettes. She seems off. But that episode two ends with the idea that he's going to move to Belize. So as yes. the audience, I'm thinking, oh shit, like this is going to become like a you know intercontinental affair. But uh, and that's and then that episode starts. We return to Ellen, who's kind of a colorful character from the first episode, and that's who he had been planning on moving to Belize with. Um, and I liked her little rundown because she said she says something about it. He made a comment that you know if you go to Belize, you can't get extradited. And she's like, I thought that was weird. <laughs> so by the end of episode two, I'm asking myself. When are we going to learn what was so appealing about Richard? Mm -hmm. Like, was the dick amazing? Like, is he eating these bitches out for days? I don't understand what's happening. Like, he doesn't seem like an a, like a physically appealing man. He doesn't have any money. The one Ellen is talking about how he would take her to fancy dinners, like at to Olive Garden. Mm -hmm. So he's not obviously not doing much. So at, by the end, by halfway through, I'm I think the documentary did a very poor job of explaining the appeal of Richard. Well, it, I wanted somebody to ask these women who would uh, be um, asked to be married after two weeks, uh, in some cases, like, w what was the intimacy like? Because there is one, Sabrina. Yes. Sabrina does, she seems like the most vulnerable and honest about how she was just, like, she just had never felt, no person ever made her feel wanted. Yeah. But the other ladies, like the first two, Tracy. Well, she's got daughters. But she's that. acting like... She's a prize. She's not. So <laughs> we'll get into all that. Sure, but, but but nobody's talking about how. What was the chemistry like? And what there right. there, there is a lack of intimate details, which yes. is suspicious. Yes. Um, and maybe that's just because. And and again, like not to make it tawdry or salacious, like we don't need to know pornographic details. I do. But but, but like I know that if I was describing how I felt about a relationship I'd been with, there would be mention of that. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, those those are red flags. So episode three, we're introduced to the idea that at one point uh, Richard was married to a woman who he ended up hit like beating up with an iPad, uh, and he gets arrested and uh, has like a domestic violence charge against him. We're also introduced to a woman named Lee. Lee's interesting. Lee is like a straight up drunk. Yeah. Straight up alcoholic who he's taken advantage of. Basically, he she is presented as having money. Well, she's an ex of his as well, right? She's an ex yeah. of his. She's also defending him, saying he's a good guy. But what's weird is he uses her for, like, I think he told Ellen, like, oh, I'm a good guy. Just, like, use this character reference, Lee, to t tell you how wonderful I am, which is So Lee's weird. important because Lee has a dad named Oscar, mm -hmm. and Oscar um, has, like, a big boat. It's like an old boat that they try to call a yacht, but it looks like a big old pontoon, mm -hmm. like a spring break, uh, Lake Havasu type situation. But he has this boat... And another sort of like, I feel like another tactic to try to get us to feel like something's going to happen is they stake out Richard because now he's in Tennessee. And they, there, there's like quite a bit of time in episode three following her, him around. We see him go to this boat with Oscar. Oscar leaves. Richard's doing suspicious stuff at the boat, like rinsing things off. So I was 100% sure that he had killed someone in that boat. Mm -hmm. But ultimately we find out that the boat, like... After Richard's ar uh, arrested, like the next day, we get footage of the boat sinking. Mm -hmm. Like it's like halfway in yeah. the water. So we assume Richard sank it, and then Lee so hypothesizes he that because Richard worked at an RV boat shop, and Lee says, "Oh, he did that on purpose because his shop takes salvaged boats that they buy for like nothing after they've sunk, and then refurbishes them and sells them for a bunch." Yeah, so he scuttled the boat. Basically, yeah. so we learned that. Um, episode three was the most frustrating to me because I kept the documentary doesn't explain because we have a bounty hunter who keeps saying like she can't get to him the the other women who are involved uh, keep saying like we can't call the police I don't understand the documentary doesn't explain like if I know you have a warrant for your arrest and you're sitting here can I just call the police and say like hey this person but they say they can't do that. Well, because okay, they uh, Carla ends up getting them in touch because she has no jurisdiction, which yeah. they don't explain. Like I don't understand what a bounty hunter does and what jurisdiction they have. Sure, but so they get them in touch with this PI team, and the man that uh, is kind of narrating this portion explains 
uh, why they don't call the police and basically they want to establish what Richard's um, pattern of behavior is like where he'll be at a certain time which makes sense like if you this person that's hard to uh, get a hold of and track down they want to make sure he is where he is by the time the cops get there but it's just the way that even it plays out when Sam, when um is it gene finally does call the police when he's at a super eight like he leaves during the middle of <laughs> so you put us through all this and he does exactly what you said he would do so that's why i don't understand like why didn't y'all just call the police the minute you knew where he was because when we find out he's working at the crab shack and they see See him go there why wouldn't you just call the police and say hey this like fugitive is at the crab shack I think they wanted to follow him around and film him right and that's my problem with this documentary is it's just making shit up to make it riveting this is real basic but anyway episode three were also a couple funny things were introduced oh well first Lee at one point describes herself because this lady is a wreck yes. she is a wreck Physically and mentally, but she compares herself to Heather Locklear's character in Melrose Place, which I thought was hilarious. We're also introduced to Richard's sister, Tony, who's significantly younger than him, mm -hmm. and she kind of gives background on the family as well. She also explains that Richard used to pretend that she was his daughter to get attention from women, mm -hmm. and his aunt said the same, that he would tell people he was his mother, kind of to like make her like vulnerable and that's why she did a lot of things she shouldn't have for him he did the same thing with oscar calling him dad mm -hmm. to build his trust mm -hmm. so we learned that episode four is um so richard's been arrested mm -hmm. they caught his ass in front of a dillard's uh in some mall in tennessee mm -hmm. um we get um sort of a breakdown of like who they've they they kind of show the footage to everyone like the surveillance footage that we saw in episode three mm -hmm. which again makes me feel like they're really just trying to fill up three and a half hours because they're just showing the same footage we already saw mm -hmm. the only thing that i wrote down from that is he is dating everyone like they just show him dating like five women like back to back right which is interesting so they have these um very nice illustrated um graphics, yeah. graphics and montages that are happening that you know that they're supposed to comprise the uh themes of the film uh, and, and give it a certain tone and mood and I, I get all that and that works just fine but at the same time it would have been great to get a timeline yeah. that kind of roughly puts together when and where these women are because even even the revenge squad these women are like I'm wife number eight or nine they're all very well aware of where they fit into um, his scheming uh, and when uh, Ewing and Grady finally do interview him they're asking they quiz him on his wives and which of course he fucks up on and so it would have been nice to get um you know some, something kind of makeshift maybe that's always fluctuating as more truths are yes are told. like instead of which i will admit are some cool graphics in the documentary instead of that give us like something to help us keep track of where we are in space and time mm -hmm. because we'll get into it but i'm very confused like how this man was able to do all these supposed things that don't really amount to much anyway um, so the highlight of this docu-series is when we actually get to talk to or listen to Richard. Mm -hmm. So he's in jail. They set up their camera. He comes out. He sits down. He wants to tell his side of the story. He wants to tell his side of the story because he's willing to own what he did, but he's not going to own what he didn't do. Spoiler alert, he doesn't own up to anything, but right. <laughs> um, he is riveting. Yeah. The only reason to watch this documentary is, I guess, the last episode airs September something. You should oh, yeah. just watch that episode. Well, because, because that episode explains everything we just watched. It, it's true, but I think that you need the juxtaposition of the women. Uh, it's it just that it could have been a class. You could watch episode one and episode four. Sure, sure. But but yeah, to understand like what was so great about this man because all the pictures because he didn't like to be on film all the pictures you see of him are like oh. when was he cute when was he popping I don't know I think I, as I a young man the, the, but <laughs> sure we'll get it more to that but the, the the last episode is talking about him he doesn't admit to anything he is very forthcoming because strangely probably because he knows he's not really in trouble because he really didn't do anything illegal right. Taking advantage of people's hearts and, and finances when you're married is, I mean, that's kind of what most married couples do. Like, I mean, <laughs> to me, it just seems like whatever. We get to see that. The documentary doesn't explain how much time is spent in jail, but then we see them following him after he's released. And like I said, 
he's back with another woman. The end. So I have a few notes. One, I immediately upon watching him, I'm like, oh, he's, he's hom- gay. He's homosexual. He's gay. I'm a hundred percent sure that man's gay. Um, but you know, we don't know. <laughs> we, we don't know. Uh, but but my gay dar was definitely peaked. Uh, because he obviously doesn't. I mean, there are many men who. Uh, manipulate and and objectify and take advantage of women who are not gay but I just think the way he talks to these women and the way he acts it's very suspect yes that's more interesting to me than well he's you know he's he's obviously not afraid to seem vulnerable which is of course commendable but but it's in a way that is not authentic and as he, for, the way that the two uh, documentarians are coming at him they are not buying a minute of it either based on the tone of their voice of the snippets you get, but uh, yeah, it doesn't seem real. It, in that same vein, I thought he seeing him talk in the jail. He reminded me of the drag queen Trinity the Tuck. Yeah, <laughs> like in his appearance and the way he speaks. But anyway, um, my only other thought. Oh, is, but the best parts to me is like they keep the camera on him when he's like, he's just said something he thinks is like profound to explain himself, and then he he's all fidgety and nervous, and then t- takes a drink of whatever he has coffee. <laughs> That that little twenty minutes of him talking is gold, right? But, but they need to release all of the minutes they have of him talking. But it makes me. It, it also makes me feel bad because then again, it it does make the perpetrator seem more interesting than the victims. Um, yeah. So and and I like I love seeing women fight back, Carl. Like it is cathartic. To see a group of women coming together and saying, you know, we're going to do something. Like, what is it? Sabrina talking about, like, you fuck me over. Fuck you. I'm going to find you. That's the energy. She's I the want. only one who I felt like, like I fell for. But the rest, the, the documentary does such a poor job of explaining what he did. Because they show, there's a brief little thing where they, sh- one of the women shows like, oh, he wrote a check for a Porsche. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This lady looks like... <sighs> Like, she just looks like she wouldn't have money to pay for the tires on this Porsche. But then she says he wrote a check for it. How? How? Also, how the documentary doesn't explain how he... Just because you marry someone doesn't mean you automatically have all of their money. Especially when you don't, like, the, as the woman, don't have any money. Right. And then a couple of them, like Carla, the Crab Shack lady, says that one day he was online and filled out an application for, like, a business credit card. Okay. So, I mean, what, you qualified for like 30, 40 grand and he, okay. But then you also started this business, so he couldn't have taken all the money because you will, I just have so many questions. Because I, I don't think it is about the money. Right. So. I think this documentary is vague because it, what, what they thought they had was like this group of women who want to exact vengeance on this man and they have this bounty hunter at the head of it. But at the end of the day, I just, it, I think it made the victims look worse. Because they just look dumb and basic to me. Not that I think they deserve to be taken advantage of, but the way the documentary shows it, it's just, I'm so confused. Like, what did you see in this man? And what exactly did he do? Oh, you guys bought a house? Okay, when you're married and you buy a house, when you sell it, you guys split the profits. I I think that they... So I don't understand, like, what what money did he get? There needed to be an explanation, or there not an explanation, there needed to be more um, exploration of the insidiousness of what he's doing, and also how we live in a culture that allows for this to happen continually. Like, this is... He is not... Which Carl, the bounty hunter does explain, like, the law doesn't really support this type... You know, it it doesn't really... It it, it doesn't help anyone avoid these types of scenarios. And because these crimes are so minor, law enforcement is not out here looking for these petty crimes. Because in the big scheme of things, what Richard did is nothing. Because Carla says, like, there are murderers out here they're trying to catch. They're not worried about some guy... The system is... Who ran up your credit card, so... The The system's broken, but... but it, it also be, gets into that weird gray area because we, uh, how our culture um, b- raises and conditions women to be treated a certain way. Uh, th- th- there's a lot, uh, there, there's a myriad of components I think that could be teased out uh, more effectively uh, th- th- than they are. That would make this, that would make the profundity of it uh, hit home. Well, like you said, it would have been great to also have maybe like some healthcare, like mental health professionals, relationships. Like they do with, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, God, I can't believe I'm blinking on his name. The doc, what, R. Kelly. 
Yeah, like mm -hmm. Surviving R. Kelly, how mm -hmm. we have like healthcare, uh, mental health professionals talking about how these women could have been manipulated. So that by the end of that docuseries, you know, you do sort of like empathize with the victims more. But in this one, I just... Because I think you only get the PI calling him a sociopath. Which, right. which is what yeah. I would have called him too, but 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 he's what, not qualified to call this man a sociopath. But sociopath, all he's done is followed him for three days. That's like saying someone's schizophrenic. It's very like, oh, that's a catch-all term for weird behavior. And then you know, to compare it to Dirty John briefly, it's like what was so riveting about it was not only I. What was more riveting was the victim because John Meehan was just a you know an opportunist, but it's like he found like a big like dumb fish who's going to give him all this stuff. And he was living the life that supported the fraud he committed. But Richard, they, they find him in Tennessee, looking frumpy as hell, driving a late 90s Toyota RAV4. Mm -hmm. Not another RAV4. Yeah, making him a murderer. <laughs> um, it just is like, I'm not impressed. Um, what would you give this docuseries? Uh, two out of five. I would give it two out of five, because I will say two out of the four episodes are... There's a, there's, worth watching. there's a colorful cast of uh, characters that are in there. Um, colorful, like, I mean... Yeah, a little bit hamming it up, I think, for, for the cameras. But, but there, there are some things of interest. I, I just think that it was... We are in a time now where uh, binge-watching has become the norm, and so everything uh, in this format has to be stretched. Uh, it feels like what I, I think there's a way that this could have been compelling and efficiently told uh, in a, a 90 minute documentary running. This could have been a Dateline episode, like a 45 minute Dateline episode. Keith Morrison would have wrapped this shit up. The thing about Pam. The thing about... <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> no, that's okay. Right. Bye. bye.